Well, good morning. It's a, a wonderful morning to be here, and the weather's getting beautiful. It's great to be here to worship the Lord and um, just to express our joy, um, just the, the joy that we have of being born again, of knowing the Lord Jesus, and we get to declare his praises together this morning. So at this time, will you please stand and we'll join together in song. Please remain standing for our scripture reading. It comes from Psalm 113, where we read, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is enthroned on high? who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. Amen. Please have a seat. Yes, um, I, I gave this message an interesting title this morning. <laughs> Um, I had a little fun with it, um, so go ahead and open your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 21, right at the end of John. We're getting close to completing our study through this amazing book. As we begin this morning, um, we'll just take a moment uh, where we can come to the Lord in prayer, each of us individually. Um, We'll have a moment of silent prayer and anything that you need to take care of between you and the Lord. You know, when we look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, um, there's a, a concept there we see is fellowship, fellowship with God, where we're, we're walking in, in close relationship with the Lord. And the, the thing that that passage instructs us is the, the thing that hinders our relationship with God is sin. And we all know it. We're all aware of it. It happens. What do we do when that happens? Well, we confess it. And then it says that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're back to that spot where we want to be, where we need to be, where we're being led of God's spirit, not of our own flesh. And we, that's where we want to be this morning when we come to study God's word. We want to be in a state of mind where his spirit living in us, speaking to us, can instruct us in the truth of his word. So we'll take a moment of, for silent prayer, and then we'll open up in prayer together, and then we'll get into our text. So let, let's pray this time. Father in heaven, you are the God who cleanses and restores and forgives. And there is no forgiveness like your forgiveness. Lord, we as people struggle with this concept in our interpersonal relationships, but you are the God who is eager to restore and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're thankful for your forgiveness this morning. As we turn our attention to your word, Lord, we ask that you would infuse it with your power. Your word is already inherently powerful, and combined with your Holy Spirit, it is exactly what we need. Lord, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand this morning, that we would desire to come to know you on a deeper level. Your word is exactly what we need for that purpose. Your word accomplishes great things in our lives. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would give us a window into your heart, into how we can live lives, the adjustments that we need to make in our lives, to live lives that are exactly on track with your character, your priorities, and what you have for us to be doing in this life. Lord, may we redeem the time, may we make the most of it. We ask that you would bless this time that we have in your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just to um, set the stage, this is the passage here at the Sea of Galilee where Jesus has already risen from the dead. We just celebrated that on uh, Resurrection Sunday a couple Sundays back. And now there's kind of this intervening time where Jesus is still appearing here and there, but he hasn't ascended back up into heaven permanently yet. And so this scene takes place on the Sea of Galilee. It's a very famous 
account, you've probably read it before, or maybe learned it in Sunday school growing up. The disciples are out there fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and lo and behold, there's Jesus on the seashore. Uh, they don't recognize him at first, come over, and he ends up feeding them breakfast. And I had this passage assigned to me, or maybe I chose it, I don't re- remember which, uh, one of the years, a couple years back at VBS. And so I decided for the little kids, you know, there's kids everywhere, there's all these little kids, and it is a blessing to be able to teach them, and that I was going to do um, kind of an object lesson. And so uh, I, I brought, just outside this door, my little hibachi grill, set it up with its propane tank, and my neighbor had stopped by recently and given me some fish. And um, I hadn't really had a plan of when I was going to eat it, it just had been hanging out in my freezer. And um, so I grabbed the fish, and I grabbed the hibachi, and I thought this would be cool to just have the fish on the hibachi and the kids can see a fish cooking. Wouldn't that be kind of fun? So I set it up and I kind of didn't really think much about it. But then at the end of the lesson, I'm like, hey, let's go side and you can see the fish on the grill. Well, by this point, it had started cooking for maybe an hour or so, just on low. I just turned it on really low and it starts smelling really good. And the kids are getting a little hungry. And, and so I pull the lid off the hibachi and the kids can't contain themselves, and they're like, can we eat it? <laughs> I hadn't even really planned that as part of my lesson, but I was like, sure, go ahead. So they're just eating, eating the, the fish right off the hibachi there. And uh, it was just a fun memory for me, but it, it always reminds me of this passage. I love this passage because it's, it, it's the tone of this passage. It's Jesus and his disciples, not all of them, but a, a certain group of them. So let's read our text this morning. Um, we find Jesus meeting his disciples, and he appears to them. This is the third time recorded by John. There was the uh, evening of the resurrection. Then there was the following Sunday. Thomas is there. He gets to see the nail holes in in Jesus' hands and side. And um, this tells us a lot about Jesus. He he, he surprises the disciples. You know, everybody, I haven't met anybody that doesn't, well, maybe there's some people that don't, that really don't like surprises, but most of us like surprises. Jesus surprises the disciples. All this, they weren't expecting him. Let's say, what were they doing here in Galilee? Well, um, you might recall that during the time around the resurrection, they received some instructions. Jesus told his disciples that he's going to meet them in Galilee. I think that explains what they're doing here in the Galilee region, but Galilee's a big place. And they don't know, you know, where is Jesus? Is he going to be hanging out with friends? Is he going to be hanging out with relatives? Is he going to be in this town or that town? They had no idea. And they couldn't just ask around because it wasn't like, you know, people knew where he was staying. Um, And so they're just there. They're present. They're in Galilee. But also at the same time, they have some they're all from Galilee. This is their home area, hometowns. They had a fishing business there. Their equipment is there. It's also a lot safer for them to be there than it is in Jerusalem at this time where they were, um, you know, in some significant danger. And so I think a lot of this sets the scene for why they're doing what they're doing. Let's look at verse 1 here. Um, Open your Bible if you don't have it. Um, we, We don't have the text up here this morning. I hit a technical problem, so Um, just follow along in in your Bible. Verses 1 through 3, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, that takes us back in our memories to the first part of John, and the sons of Zebedee, that'd be James and John, and, and two other disciples, those guys are not named, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going to come with you. They went out and got into a boat, and that night they caught nothing. So John, right off the bat, it's interesting, he uses this term, the Sea of Tiberias, which is known, if you go to Israel today, it's called not the Sea of Tiberias, it's called the Sea of Galilee, and that's how it was known historically. But during this time frame, the emperor Tiberius he started naming things after himself. And so he named the lake after himself. And he had his capital right there, um, Tiberias. And uh, so it started to kind of take on this name uh, more publicly. And John uh, picks up on this changing usage of terms of the the Sea of Tiberias. And 
Um, he references it if you go back to John chapter 6 in a similar way. And says, Jesus manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter, we get their names there. there. Um, one thing I should note is we think of the 12 disciples who became the, the 12 apostles. Uh, so Judas Iscariot drops off the scene, and into his place comes the apostle Paul later, calls himself an apostle, one born out of due time. But he basically fills that role. Um, he meets all the criteria, and the Lord uses him in a mighty way. But uh, we think of the 12 disciples. Uh, but also we need to remember that Jesus had other disciples also. So there was the, the 12, there was his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. There was the 12, and then there were other disciples who were kind of outside on the periphery as well. And we don't know exactly how many there are, but quite a few it seems. And so these two others were probably some that were just kind of on the periphery, kind of sometimes were around, sometimes weren't. And Peter uh, does what Peter always does. He you know, comes up with an idea or he just does something. He just says something, does something. He's, he's always the one who's just kind of out front. And he says, I'm going fishing. He's a fisherman. And, uh, you know, we can easily picture these disciples standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. You know, they're, they're watching maybe other fishing boats taken off into the water uh, in the evening. And uh, Peter just can't stand it any longer. And, and he's like, I'm going fishing. And Probably this announcement comes as a bit of a relief to the other disciples, and they want to join him. Um, so what are some of the factors that would maybe be propelling this? They might be hungry. You think about that. That's probably one of their main sources of food. Um, they probably have bills to pay as well. And there's just a lot of, they're, maybe they're just you know, feeling hyper. They, they, they want to be active. They want to be doing something. So... They get out, and they, it says at the end of verse 3, they're out there at night, during the evening, during the night, and they caught nothing. Um, so it wasn't because of lack of skill. They were commercial fishermen. They, they knew all about how to fish in the Sea of Galilee, but it's one of those bad excursions in that it doesn't turn up any fish. But all along, you can start to think, that God is in control of this situation, that maybe he has allowed it to transpire in such a way that they have caught nothing precisely because it's going to allow him to act in his power and he's going to enter the situation and we're going to see what he will do. And in fact, as we keep reading, that's what we see. It's now time for Jesus to take over this situation. Let's look at verse 4. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet, none of the, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So, you know, a lot of these aspects we can talk about of Jesus' resurrection body, um, he just can appear. Just wasn't there, and now he is. Um, he also isn't easily recognizable many times at first. You know, it seems like sometimes they, they recognize him right away, but a lot of other times... They uh, aren't sure. They aren't sure of his appearance. And then as, as one thing uh, takes place, another thing takes place, it immediately becomes clear to them this is Jesus. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But all this to say, Jesus is very near to them. You know, for all they know, Jesus is, you know, way off on some village elsewhere in Galilee, or maybe he's not even in Galilee yet. They don't know. To them, they, they're not sure where Jesus is, but he is near I think that has some practical application for us. The nearness of Jesus. Jesus is often much nearer to us than we realize, but like these disciples, we just don't know it. And God's will for us is that if we don't find ourselves so preoccupied with our work, and, and we see that with these disciples, that was just what was consuming them at this point. They were casting their nets and casting their nets, and they're frustrated. And it can even be our work for him. You know, we're laboring for the Lord, and we're just going, going, going. But we run the risk that we can fail to recognize him or to recognize his nearness. So a good reminder for us, in the midst of this busy fishing scene with these disciples here in verse 4, let's look at verse 5. So verse 5 we read, So Jesus said to them, Children, 
you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. I don't love that translation there, that rendering there in the New American. But the, um, the Greek word, paideon, uh, rendered their children. That, that would be the English equivalent. But in colloquial usage, common expression, it had the idea of like, we would say, hey boys, you know, just a, hey boys. And then it's stated in such a way as to basically say, it's a statement followed by a question mark, and we do this in our, in our common way of talking. It doesn't really make for correct, um, a correct way of writing something, but it's to the effect of, hey boys, you didn't catch anything? And so they, they're not sure who this is. Maybe this is you know, some other fisherman. And if you, know, you put yourself in that situation, they're probably thinking, maybe this guy's thinking about bringing his boat out. He wants to know, did you guys catch anything? Because if you did, well, you know, tell me where to go. I want to go to that part of the lake as well. You know, he's looking for tips. And so they're like, no, you know, they're, they're deflated. They're frustrated. And so they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat and you will find a catch. This is verse 6. So they cast, and, they, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. What I love here is that Jesus enters into the frustration of these disciples. He deals with them on a compassionate level. He knows that they are tired, that they're hungry, They've been out there all night. They have to be tired. They're hungry. Um, they have to be because they presumably didn't. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision. They didn't bring a big meal in the boat with them. They're also financially needy, we can assume as well, that they've been away from their fishing business. They probably you know, need to try to get some fish that they can then sell to bring in some money to um, pay their bills. All these are human needs. And what we're about to see is these human needs come crashing in to God's divine provision. And not just at any time, but at exactly the right moment. And why that's so critically important is because that is how our God works. At just the right moment, Jesus spoke to his disciples with an authoritative statement. He gives them a direction. He tells them what to do. Cast your net on the right-hand side of the boat. All he asks for them to do, he gives them an instruction and he just wants them to obey. Thankfully, they do. But how many times do we, are we resistant? You know, you're, you're kind of cringing. You're going, oh, I hope these disciples, this is Jesus talking to them. I hope they don't say no. I hope they don't say, no, you know, we've been out here all night. We already tried that. But something in them propels them to think, well, you know, whatever their rationale was, maybe he, from his vantage point on the shore, he's, he's got a little different angle or something. I don't know. But they, they figure, you know, they've, okay, we'll, we'll give it one more chance. We'll give it one last shot. Their role in this was simply to obey. So Jesus first addressed them with a question. And I love how Jesus so often asks questions. We see it again and again in the Gospels, and we see it in our own lives as well, don't we? When Jesus asks questions, they're designed for a purpose. That Jesus, um, it gets us thinking. It gets us um, considering something differently. And he always has a very specific purpose in mind for his question. He gives them a question, then he gives them a command. Their response is obedience, and then we're going to see what happens after that. We're going to see it come about by way of God's blessing. He blesses their obedience. And sometimes I think we have strange ideas about God's blessing. We think that his blessing should be some kind of a, a windfall or some kind of a, uh, you know, I don't know, what a fortune or, or something like that. But God's blessing, his greatest blessing isn't necessarily that, but it's getting his provision to us exactly what we need. He provides for us at the right moment, and he does it in very unexpected ways. So that brings us to our next takeaway this morning, God's provision. 
just when the disciples were about to give up hope that Jesus would meet them in Galilee, and just as their, their, um, their bank accounts were dwindling, just as their need for food in their stomach was increasing, just as they had reached a crisis, Jesus provided for them. And his will for us is that we trust him in the midst of the crisis. He sees your great need. Sometimes we don't feel like he does. We think, oh, it, just, it just seems impossible. It just seems overwhelming. It seems like I'm going to be crushed. It seems like there's no hope. But into that, he is right there. And he is ready and he is able to help you. So we don't want to lose sight of that. We don't want to forget that. That's the great reminder of these verses right here. I love this quote by Warren Wiersbe. He's full of these great quotes. The difference between success and failure for, for these disciples in this fishing boat was literally the width of the ship. <laughs> Going from their nets on the left side to the right side. We are never far from success when we permit Jesus to give orders, and we are usually closer to success than we realize. Are we in tune with Jesus, though? That's the thing that I think so many times presents the problem for us, is that we're, we're just in this mindset. We just go about our standard procedures. We just do it on our own, and we're not paying attention to the resource we have so near to us, and that is Jesus. Let's keep going. Um, Verse 7, we'll look at verse 7 here. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John himself, he, he likes to not refer to himself um, with the pronoun I. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord! So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. Um. So the particular garment, it was, it was kind of a, a fisherman's garment. So, you know, it, it's, he'd been out working hard, and if he's going out to meet Jesus, he figures he should, you know, put on at least a normal fisherman's clothes. And um, it's interesting to see the reaction and the response here, because John recognizes Jesus, and I think he recognizes him far more by what he says, by how he says it, and by the, just the, the interactions and the, the familiarity and the deity of Jesus. John has these spiritual eyes to see, and he recognizes all of this. And I think that that speaks a lot to when you talk about resurrection bodies, you know, we're, uh, we're not in these bodies anymore, and how, how will we recognize each other? And I think it's more of on a, a spiritual or a soul level, and there's this uh, demeanor, there's this language, there's this commonality, this familiarity, and it all just creates clarity for John all of a sudden, and as soon as John speaks it, Peter acts on it. Very characteristic of their personalities. John's more, you know, introspective, pensive, intellectual, um, you know, but also very spiritually perceptive. Peter is just filled with love for Jesus, but he can be impulsive, and he just takes action, and he's always kind of jumping out at, uh, to the lead with things. Um, let's look at verses 8 through 9. Here we read, But the other disciples came in a little boat. The word changes from the big boats to a little boat, so maybe more like a, a dinghy or a skiff. For they were not far from the land, about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So again, verse 6 has told us they do, they cast it on the right-hand side of the boat, and they, they catch in such a number that they're not even able to haul it onto the boat. They, they, could, they weren't even strong enough with all these guys to, to physically get it into the boat, or at least not without creating a problem of it just completely shearing the nets. And so they're close enough to land in this instance, a little bit different than in Luke chapter 5. And here they're like, okay, well, maybe if we can just you know, hop into the dinghy, we, we can just sort of drag it the rest of the way to shore, and then maybe the net won't break. We'll get it there. So they hop in the small dinghy, and they're working to, to bring the fish to land. But by this point, Peter has already jumped into the water and is making his way toward Jesus. And it says in uh, verse, let's look at verse 10, 
So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus invites the disciples here to come and eat with him. Jesus in his resurrection body could eat. I think that's pretty cool. You know, he's eaten with them previously, road to Emmaus. Not only does he eat, but he cooks. And so he's providing for them once again. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153, and altogether there were so many that it was, I can just picture Jesus um, having to kind of point this out to Peter like, hey, those guys still need help. Oh yeah. So he has to, you know, run back to, to the guys and help them haul this load onto shore and and presumably they maybe they're transferring it from one net to another or somehow they're they're sorting and in the midst they're counting and the count was 153 large fish um, this would be a tremendous haul for these fishermen and miraculously miracle upon miracle not only does jesus do this miracle but it says that their nets were not torn and that's one of the things we see throughout the old testament right the people were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and their shoes never wore out their clothes never gave way god miraculously sustained the things that they need to get them through as long as they needed and and that's one of the ways that god can work uh, miraculously is through preventing normal wear and tear that's incredible and so he does that here okay let's look at our next verses 12 through 14 jesus said to them come and have breakfast none of the disciples ventured to question him who are you knowing that it was the lord jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise so he's got some bread and some fish on the grill Uh, Now, this is the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Um, So, verse 10, Jesus has said, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And, uh, you know, he's already got the the grill going. He's already, verse 9, placed fish and bread. Where did they come from? I don't know. We don't know. We're not told. Jesus already has miraculous access to fish and to bread, which reminds us, boy, that makes our minds go back to when he fed the the 4,000, when he fed the 5,000. It's like, "Hmm, what can Jesus do with fish and bread? Well, these ones come out of nowhere, and he's got them on the grill there on the charcoal coals, and it's probably smelling really good, making everybody hungry. But what we notice is that Jesus provides, and he makes them breakfast. It also seems that um, he encourages them to take some more of the fish from what he has just provided and to use that to grill some more fish and to have a big feast and there's a uh, apparently enough for everybody so it is interesting that if you crunch a little bit of numbers um, you know even if they had maybe a couple fish each of this haul and they grilled them there's still going to be like a hundred and let's say 140 fish left over if you divide that by these seven disciples, they get to go home with like, what, 20 fish each, something like that. I mean, that, that's a really nice gift that they get from Jesus. But there's also something mysterious about Jesus and his resurrection body that keeps them slightly off guard. It, it's almost like they, they seem to want to ask him who he is, but they know. It's just this really interesting scene that we get here. Let's look at our takeaway number three here. It has to do with prioritizing people. And this is a reminder that we all need. Jesus came to spend time, to spend time with, to help, and to encourage his disciples. He prioritized people, and he came to them, and he met them. God's will for us is that we value others and prioritize other people above the things that the world is always so obsessed with money and things and status and self it's a really important reminder that we all need and i know we're out of time we'll we'll leave off here for this morning but these reminders are so personal because we have a god who is personal and we have a savior who is personal and jesus spent time with people he met them in their time of need and we have an opportunity to do that as well 
there's always physical needs that we need to be aware of. You know, how, how about others around us? Are, are they um, having a hard time? Has the Lord positioned me in a place to help me that need, a physical need or a spiritual need. Maybe I can pray with them. That prayer is powerful. Um, but in addition to those needs, the greatest need that every single person has in this world is for a Savior. They need to know the love of Jesus. They need to know the one who came and died for them. I think that's the great uh, thing that we celebrate on a, on a day like today where we celebrate life. And, um, you know, CareNet is a ministry that's focused on life, and it's about twofold. It's about um, saving lives physically, and it's about sharing the good news of life spiritually. That people, that the priorities should be our priorities as well. But where does that need come in when it comes to needing life spiritually? Well, there's only one who gives it. And God has rescued us from death. We always know death to be terrible, right? It, it just is painful. It separates. It's hard. No matter how the world may spin it, you know, um, and unfortunately, humanity has done that for thousands of years, trying to spin death as in somehow a, you know, a, a virtue, uh, you know, well, this will accomplish a greater good, you know, people just need to, to die, to sacrifice for a greater good. There's only one who could die for a greater good, and who could sacrifice so that everyone else could live, and not only here and now and today and in our generation, but every single person who's ever lived on the face of planet earth and whoever will live, and that's Jesus Christ. He died so that everyone could have life. How did he do it? He went to the cross. He laid down his life, the God-man. He was perfect. He was sinless, uniquely able to come and to pay for our sins in our place, to die so that we could live. He died to redeem you, you and me and each one of us. He came to give us life, to rescue us from death and bring us into life. The gift of eternal life is before us through him, through his sacrifice, through his selflessness of going to the cross and laying down his life. What will you do with that gift? Will you respond to it today? I pray that if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, that today would be the day when you say, I need his sacrifice on my behalf. I'm receiving that gift. I'm accepting his love. Greater love has no one than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. Um, God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. It's the ultimate manifestation of love. Love came down to earth, and love came and died for you and me. If you've never placed your personal faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that you will do that this morning before leaving this place. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this day, for the unique um, treat that we have to hear, to learn more about the ministry of CareNet, to celebrate your gift of life, your priority of life. Life is one of your divine attributes, so we pray that that would be one of our priorities as well. Lord, we ask that this message we've had this morning, this passage we've covered would resonate with us, that it would provide us with some great reminders that we need, that it would challenge us, that we would not go forth from here the same as we came in this morning, but we would have an encounter with the living God through your living word. Lord, we ask that you would do your great work in and through us, that you would keep us connected to you this week through the power of your indwelling Holy Spirit. We ask your blessing on each one here. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we'll close with this scripture from... Matthew chapter 11, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take your yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen.